if we can just rewind a little bit to uh, the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015, I think, which was for people who are familiar with the DARPA challenges, it uh, was first with autonomous vehicles and there's a lot of interesting challenges around that. And the DARPA Robotics Challenge was when uh, humanoid robots were tasked to do all kinds of, uh, you know, manipulation, walking, driving, driving a car, all these kinds of challenges with, if I remember correctly, sort of some slight capability to communicate with humans, but uh, the communication was very poor. So it basically has to be almost entirely autonomous. You could have periods where the communication was entirely interrupted and the robot had to be able to proceed. Yeah. But you could provide some high level guidance to the robot, basically low, low bandwidth communications uh, yeah. to steer it. I watched that challenge with kind of tears in my eyes, eating popcorn. With, with harp. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I wasn't personally losing, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And many years of incredible hard work by some of the most brilliant roboticists in the world. So that that was why the tragic, well, that's why <laughs> the tears came. So anyway, what, what have you, um, just looking back to that time, what have you learned from that experience? Uh, and maybe if you could describe what it was, uh, sort of the setup for people who haven't seen it. Well, so there was a contest where a bunch of different um, robots were asked to do a series of tasks, uh, some of those that you mentioned, drive a vehicle, get out, open a door, go identify a valve, shut a valve, use a tool to maybe cut a hole in um, a surface, and then crawl over some stairs and maybe some rough terrain. So it was, the idea was have a, a general purpose robot that could do lots of different things. Um, had to be mobility and manipulation, onboard perception. And there was a contest, uh, which DARPA likes uh, at the time was running, sort of follow on to the, the grand challenge, which was let's, let's try to push vehicle autonomy along, right? They, they, they encourage people to build autonomous cars. So they're trying to basically push an industry forward. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we were asked, our role in this was to build um, a humanoid. At the time, it was our sort of first generation Atlas robot. And we built maybe 10 of them. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, and DARPA distributed those to various teams um, that sort of won a, a contest, uh, showed that they uh, could, you know, program these robots and then use them to compete against each other. And then other robots were introduced as well. Some teams built their own robots. Carnegie um, Mellon, for example, built their own robot. And, uh, and all these robots competed to see who could sort of get through this, this maze um, of the fastest. And uh, again, I think the purpose was to kind of push the whole industry forward uh, we provided the robot and some baseline software, but we didn't we didn't actually compete as a participant mm -hmm. uh, where we were trying to uh, you know drive the robot through this maze. Uh, we were just trying to support the other teams. It was humbling because it was it was really a hard task. and and honestly, the robots, the tears were because mostly the robots didn't do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. they fell down you know, uh, repeatedly, um, it was hard to get through this contest. Uh, you know, some did and, and, you know, they were rewarded and won, but it was humbling because of just how hard these tasks weren't all that hard. A person could have done it very easily. Um, but it was really hard uh, to get the robots to do it, you know, well, the, hard... the general nature of it, the, the variety of it, the variety. And also that, I don't know if the tasks were sort of, the task in themselves help us understand what is difficult and what is not. I don't know if that was obvious before the contest was designed. So you kind of try to figure that out. And I think uh, Atlas is really a general robot platform and it's perhaps not best suited for the specific tasks of that contest. Like for, for just, for example, probably the hardest task is not the driving of the car, but getting in and out of the car <laughs> and Atlas, probably, you know, if you were to design a robot that can get into the car 
easily and get out easily, you probably would not make Atlas, that particular car. Yeah, the, the robot was a little bit big yeah. to get in and out of that car, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't fit, but yeah. Th this is the curse of a general purpose robot, that they're not perfect at any one thing, uh, but they might be able to do a, a wide variety of things. And and that is that is the goal at the end of the day. You know, I think we all wanna build general purpose robots that can be used for lots of different activities, but it's hard. And um, and the wisdom in, in building successful robots up until this point have been, go build a robot for a specific task and it'll do it very well. Mm -hmm. And as long as you control that environment, it'll operate perfectly. But But robots need to be able to deal with uncertainty. If they're gonna be useful to us in the future, they need to be able to deal with unexpected uh, situations. And that's sort of the goal of a general purpose or multi-purpose robot. And that's just darn hard. And so some of the, you know, there's these curious little failures. Like I remember one of the, a robot, you know, the first the first time you start to try to push on the world with a robot, mm -hmm. you you forget that the world pushes back and, and will push you over <laughs> if you're not ready for it. And the robot, you know, reached to grab the door handle. I think it missed the grasp of the door handle, mm -hmm. was expecting that its hand was on the door handle. Mm -hmm. And so when it tried to turn the knob, it just threw itself over. It didn't realize, oh, I had missed the door handle. I didn't have, mm -hmm. I didn't, I was expecting a force back from the door. It wasn't there. And then I lost my balance. So these little simple things that you and I would take totally for granted and deal with, <laughs> the robots mm -hmm. don't know how to deal with yet. And so you have to start to deal with all of those uh, circumstances. <laughs> well, I think a lot of us experience this in, uh, even when sober, but drunk too, uh, sort of you pick up a thing and expect it to be, what is it, heavy? And it turns out to be light. Yeah, and then you, whoa. Oh yeah. yeah, and then, so the same, and I'm sure if your depth perception for whatever reason is screwed up, if you're, if you're drunk or some other reason, and then you think you're putting your hand on the table, and you miss it. I mean, it's the same kind of situation. Yeah. Um, but there's Which is why you need to be able to predict forward just a little bit. And so that's where this model predictive control stuff uh, comes in. Predict forward what you think's gonna happen. And then if and if that does happen, you're in good shape. If something else happens, you better start predicting again. So re, <laughs> re like re re uh regenerate a plan. Yeah. When you don't I mean that um that also requires a very uh fast feedback loop of updating uh, what your prediction, how it matches to the actual real world. Yeah, those things have to run pretty quickly. What's the challenge of running things pretty quickly? A thousand hertz of acting and sensing quickly. You know, there's a few different layers of that. You, you want at the lowest level, you like to run things typically at around a thousand hertz, which means that, you know, at each joint of the robot, you're measuring position or force, and then trying to control your actuator, whether it's a hydraulic or electric motor, trying to control the force coming out of that actuator. And you wanna do that really fast, something like a thousand hertz. And that means you can't have too much calculation going on at that joint. Um, but that's pretty manageable these days, and, and it's fairly common. And then there's another layer that you're probably calculating, you know, maybe at a hundred hertz, maybe 10 times slower which is now starting to look at the overall body motion and thinking about the, the larger physics of, of, the, uh, of the robot. Um, and then there's yet another loop that's probably happening a little bit slower, which is where you start to bring you know, your perception in, your vision and things like that. And so you need to run all of these loops sort of simultaneously. You do have to manage your, your computer time so that you can squeeze in all the calculations you need in real time in a very consistent way. Um, and the amount of calculation we can do is increasing as computers get better, which means we can start to do more sophisticated calculations. I can have a more complex model doing my forward prediction, and and that might allow me to do even better predictions as I, as I get better and better. And, and it used to be, again, we had, you know, 10 years ago, we had to have pretty simple models that we were running, you know, at those fast rates because the computers weren't as capable about calculating forward with a, a sophisticated model. But as, as computation gets better, we can 
We can do more of that.